This is part one of the introduction to the periodic table. It serves as a review of grade 9 and 10. If you're looking at some of the more advanced trends on the periodic table, then uh, please skip ahead to some of the other video clips in this series. So, here we go. This is the periodic table. The periodic table can divide, be divided into three sections. And in order to do that, we need to draw a little staircase. So here I go, drawing a little staircase. Now, this staircase divides the periodic table into three parts. Uh, the metals, metalloids, and non-metals. Now, the metalloids are any elements that touch one full side of the staircase. So as long as they touch one full side of the staircase, it is a metalloid. So this is a metalloid, this is a metalloid, so are these two, and these two over here. Now, the only exception to the rule, of course, is this guy, which happens to be aluminum. And aluminum is a metal. All right, so everyone else, though, anyone that touches a full side of the uh, staircase is considered to be a metalloid. Now, if it just touches a corner, like this guy over here, just touching a corner, that is not a metalloid. You must touch one full side to be a metalloid. Now, by drawing in the metalloids, we have essentially just uh, divided the periodic table into two parts. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the metals. So these are the elements over here. Okay, so these are all essentially metals, including here and including aluminum. Uh, these are called the inner transition metals. We also contain, uh, consider them to be metals, and they are usually included in this little gap over here. However, due to uh, the space restrictions, we do take out the inner transition metals and we locate them at the bottom of the periodic table. Now, the exception to this rule is, of course, hydrogen, which is not a metal. It is instead a non-metal. Alright, so non-metal. Now, in general, the non-metals exist on the right-hand side of the metalloid staircase, with the exception, of course, of hydrogen. And there we have it. Uh, these, this is the first, most basic trend of the periodic table. We have the non-metals on the left-hand side, or right-hand side, rather. Then we have the metalloids right down the middle on the staircase, with the exception, of course, of aluminum. Then finally, we have the metals on the left-hand side of the periodic table, with the exception of hydrogen, which is a non-metal. So now that we've organized the periodic table into three major categories, uh, the metals, the metalloids, and the non-metals, we can go a little bit deeper into the uh, trends of the periodic table. So first up, the horizontal, or rather the vertical columns on a periodic table are called groups. All right, so this one would be group one, this would be group two, group three, group four, etc, etc, etc. This one would be group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. All right, so these are all groups. On the other hand, uh, horizontal rows on the periodic table are called periods. So this would be period number one, period number two, period number three, period number four, period five, period six, and period seven. All right, all reaching across this way. Period three, period four, and you get the idea. Now this column over here, this little block, the inner transition elements, just so you remember, they go right in here, so this little gap. So technically this would be part of period six, and this would be part of period seven. The only reason why it's not in here right now is because, well, for logistical reasons. I mean, the paper is just not wide enough. And so if you had to imagine bringing this whole section and then shifting it all in that direction, just so you could fit this guy over here in here, it would be, well, really weird to print out. Now, just so you know, this is the current numbering system. Uh, however, there is an older numbering system that is still commonly being used. Uh, let me just write this one in just so you know how it works. So this one was called the group 1A. So this was called A block. 
and this was called group 2A and this was the A block. Now these guys over here uh, we don't really care too much about them in terms of periodic trends just because they're called the transition elements. All right? The transition elements don't follow periodic trends very well as you will see later on. So because of that it makes it very hard to predict what kind of properties there will be for these guys. Anyway these guys were called the B block. All right, so uh, you don't really have to know about the numbering system for the B block. It's not really necessary for our periodic trends. However, this block over here continues on with the A block. So this would be group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. All right, so this group over here could be called group 18 or group 8A. Either or is acceptable. All right. Uh, this would be group 17 or 7A, 16 or 6A. Similarly over here, group 2 or group 2A, group 1 or group 1A. So you'll notice that uh, this makes it easier over here. You can say it's group 13 or group 3A. And again, the B block, the transition elements, and also the inner transition elements, I don't really care too much about them. They're not really necessary. Okay? No, at least not for this course. Now the next trend I want to look at uh, requires you to have done your Bohr-Rutherford diagram. So this was the first formative uh, assignment that I gave you. All right, so make sure you have that one done. Once completed, you should be able to see a lovely little pattern uh, being formed with a periodic table, and that is what a periodic table is, or the, uh, basically a trend, or a period, or a regular repeating pattern. So you will find that both hydrogen and helium only have one shell. All right, so both hydrogen and helium only have one shell. On the other hand, in period two, everyone over here tends to have two shells, right, all across this period. Over here, three shells, if you have drawn it correctly, of course. And finally, the last one, four shells. Uh, right now, space. Four shells. That is horrible. All right, and that is the first 20 elements of the periodic table. So what this means is as you go down the periodic table, all right, so period 1, period 2, period 3, period 4, as you go down the period, the number of electron shells increases. Right? So first period, one shell. Second period, two shells. Third period, three shells. Four shells, five shells, and then six shells. So if you look carefully at your Bohr-Rutherford diagram, you'll find that I've basically taken these two A blocks over there and also over here. I'm sorry, I've drawn it incorrectly. This line should be a whole A block over here. All right. So I've taken these two A blocks. I like to call them the mountains because, well, they're, they're kind of like the mountains over here and over here is the valley. Anyway, I've taken these two A blocks and I've slammed them together essentially. All right? And by slamming them together, I have essentially put these representative elements together, which allows us to more easily see the uh, patterns and the trends of the periodic table. All right? So this is where they were slammed together, essentially. Now, we've already talked about the first trend, where as we go down each group, you increase the number of shells. So for instance, this one over here, one shell, period one. One shell, period one. Over here, this whole period, period 2, has two shells. Then there's period 3, they should all have three shells. And finally, period 4 should all have four shells, if you have drawn your Moore Rutherford diagrams correctly. Now, the next periodic trend that we want to look at is the number of valence electrons. All right, so valence meaning outer shell, electrons well, meaning electrons. So if you look at group 1A, all, right, all of these guys in group 1A, they should all have one valence electron meaning one electron in the outermost shell. And everyone in group 2A would have, well, two valence electrons in their outermost shell. So this one is in group period 3, so it should have three shells. And because it's in group 2A, it should have two valence electrons. And so forth and so forth. You'll see the lovely little pattern over here. Three. This one should have four valence electrons in its outer shell. This one will have five and six for oxygen. And then if you carry on the pattern, fluorine, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, and culminating in neon, which should have eight valence electrons in its outer shell, if you have done your calculations correctly. So as you go from left to right on the periodic table, you increase the number of valence electrons. So let's uh, play a little bit of Battleship. Let's take a look at, uh, let's say, this element over here. I don't even know what element that is. But because I know it's in period three, it should have three shells. And because it's in group 5A, it should have five valence electrons. So even though I've never haven't drawn the uh, Bohr-Rutherford diagram for this particular element, I know how many shells there are and how many valence electrons there are. Let's try another one. Let's go with this guy over here. Argon. All right, so argon is in period three. And what do we know about periods? Periods tells us how many shells there are. So this should have three shells altogether. Now, because it's in group 8A, it should have eight valence electrons. And hopefully, if you compare this to your Bohr-Rutherford diagram assignment, uh, you should have eight valence electrons and three electron shells. So even though I haven't actually drawn out the formal Bohr-Rutherford diagram for argon over here, I can determine how many shells there are going to be and how many valence electrons there are going to be just by looking at its position in the periodic table. Huh, that's kind of weird. Alright, so that concludes our brief introduction to the periodic table. Uh, the next video clip will deal with, I believe, uh, chemical reactions and why chemical bonds form. Alright, so see you there.